During World War II, industry was booming, and cities across America were booming too. Shipyards popped up along city waterfronts and riverfronts, industrial businesses moved into downtown towers, and warehouses were built along railroad tracks. But once the war ended, industry needed a new focus. The reconversion of war plans to peacetime pursuits is going ahead at full speed. Vets came home. Most of the men who went away to war returned by the millions. Factories went from making war materials to washing machines. Consumer goods of all kinds were coming off the assembly lines. And the suburbs became the most desirable real estate in America. Young families flock to buy a piece of the American dream. It's the good life in the suburbs. Incentivized by cheap federal mortgage loans and newly constructed speedy highways, middle and upper class white families left urban downtowns in droves. But due to policies like redlining, exclusionary zoning, and racial covenants, African Americans and some other groups were explicitly denied this opportunity. And so as urban factories shut down after the war, or they moved to huge facilities in the suburbs where land was now cheaper, Manufacturing jobs left cities too, and that left urban workers behind. And when industry started to leave the U.S. in the 70s and 80s and go abroad, the situation got even worse for working-class Americans in cities. The trend hit manufacturing cities particularly hard, especially places like Buffalo. Manufacturing has always been in the DNA of Buffalo and Western New York. And that's why when you come here, you see these huge, underutilized factories of the past, which is almost like the ancient Mayan ruins, right? That's Stephen Tucker, an expert in workforce development who moved to Buffalo in 2017 to head the Northland Workforce Training Center, an organization with a mission to prepare local residents for careers in advanced manufacturing and clean energy. From his own history, Stephen knows just how much access to good-paying manufacturing jobs can change lives. I worked in manufacturing before. When I left Ford Motor Company, with overtime, I was making almost $100,000 a year, which is transformative. You can access these jobs with a high school diploma and a little bit of a specific training. The Northland Workforce Training Center is the anchor of the Northland Corridor Redevelopment Project, a state-led initiative to invest millions into Buffalo and bring manufacturing jobs back. This multi-million dollar project is laser focused on a particular part of Buffalo, the east side, where the vast majority of the city's African-American residents live. Like many U.S. cities, Buffalo has a long history of redlining, urban renewal, and highway construction that destroyed much of the east side in the mid-20th century. As a result, even as other parts of Buffalo have begun to revitalize, the east side has been locked out of that growth. It remains one of the city's poorest neighborhoods. So the state took an intentional approach to uh, make sure that they created access to opportunities for residents in the neighborhoods instead of just focusing on downtown. How do we create an atmosphere and an environment to attract local or attract companies from outside of the area? Northland started by revitalizing their own industrial building, a huge 240,000-square-foot facility from the early 1900s that used to house a sheet metal factory. The building doesn't just hold the training center. It also holds companies that can house all of their manufacturing, engineering, and R&D teams. And we even had a gentleman, he was in the front of our lobby, and he, he was very emotional because he was one of the original engineers at the manufacturing plant from the 40s. And he said he's just excited to see something happening with this facility again. It was pretty, it was pretty powerful. Stevens actively recruiting new companies to set up shop and to stay. Not just in the center, but throughout the redevelopment corridor. And Stephen told us that it's starting to work. Many new manufacturing companies have recently moved into the area. And now other businesses are starting to pop up around them. So it's very exciting right now to be on the east side of Buffalo. Just four years ago, there was no one walking on Northland Avenue, and now there's more than 500 people here every day. Now there's multiple banking institutions moving into the east side of Buffalo. As a matter of fact, one of our banking partners, Bank on Buffalo, they're going to be co-located within our facility, and they're going to be providing second chance checking accounts for students who need it, as well as financial empowerment training. There's now grocery stores, one around the corner from where we're located at. We're now starting to see people take more pride in their homes. 
though, we're starting to see the investment really take effect here on the east side. So it's clear that in Buffalo, the return of manufacturing is catalyzing a more equitable revitalization of the city. Right. And by creating access to these jobs, both via proximity and skills training, Northland is forging a pathway for folks in the city who, until now, have been excluded from the benefits of the city's growth. And what Buffalo's doing could happen across the U.S. For years, we've allowed our manufacturing facilities to leave urban cores and go abroad, both to the detriment of Americans looking for jobs and to cities overall. But imagine if cities began to intentionally bring manufacturing back. We could potentially create wealth-generating opportunities for people who need it. We could jumpstart development in disinvested neighborhoods. And maybe even provide a new, more resilient economic model for our cities. Welcome to City of the Future, a podcast by Sidewalk Labs. Each episode, we explore the ideas and innovations that could transform cities. We're your hosts. I'm Eric Jaffe. And I'm Vanessa Quirk. In our previous episode, we talked about tech-focused innovation ecosystems, mixed-use urban developments that aim to generate more opportunities for those who have been left behind by tech's growth. This episode, we're talking about ecosystems that bring next-generation manufacturing back into our urban cores. But they have the same aim, creating more equitable and inclusive cities. So as we learned from the story of Buffalo, when manufacturing left American cities, it caused severe economic distress in many low-income and Black neighborhoods. But before that, when factories were located in urban cores, workers could easily walk or bike to these kinds of jobs. There was a lot to love about those lively urban cores of the early 20th century. But we shouldn't paint too rosy of a picture. Despite the benefit of living close to a job, You also lived near a loud, potentially polluting factory, and that had significant drawbacks. Absolutely. And as we know from the history of zoning in this country, low-income people frequently had no option but to live in neighborhoods zoned for intense commercial or industrial use. And today we know the consequences of that. Consequences that have been most severely felt by communities of color who continue to suffer from higher rates of health issues like asthma and cancer. In fact, data shows that residents who live in majority Black census tracts are twice as likely to develop cancer from industry-related air pollution than people in majority white tracts. So bringing manufacturing back into urban neighborhoods, especially neighborhoods that have experienced this type of disinvestment and that may have historically been exposed to the pollution and negative externalities of industry, that seems fraught. It is, and you can't take on something like that lightly. But I'd argue that it also offers an opportunity to right some of these historic wrongs. Right. Because as we saw in Buffalo, it can really bring not just jobs and wealth to individuals, but revitalize whole communities and neighborhoods. So the question becomes, can we bring the benefits of industry back to these neighborhoods without the drawbacks? That is the question. And many people think the answer is yes. Because manufacturing today is fundamentally different than it used to be. Think about microbreweries or makerspaces. And that's just the start. In fact, today, there are very advanced manufacturing companies that are way cleaner and greener than the factories of yore. So there's no gearbox. There's nothing to shift. You just twist the throttle and... uh... That is the sound of an electric motorcycle made by Tarform. It's sleek, matte black... The kind of ride Batman would look right at home on. Tarform is just one of the many next-gen manufacturing companies based at the Brooklyn Navy Yard in New York City. Across the yard's 300 acres, you can find all kinds of prototypes. While I was there, I saw a drone taking off. I saw Sidewalk Labs' flexible street prototype. Flexible streets. Shout out to episode 15. Exactly. And I even got to ride in my very first self-driving vehicle. Nice stop at the stop sign here. Complete stop. More than I would have done, let's be honest. And of course, there are companies at the yard making very cool things that you can only see if you go inside one of the buildings. Like Kingdom Supercultures, for example. 
They're a company that's trying to replace the artificial chemicals in our foods with natural microorganisms. Nice. Sounds very futuristic. Yeah, it's super cool. And I got to tour their office at the yard. And there was a lot of fancy science equipment and beakers and flow hoods. And it was all safe enough that their 25-person team could work on laptops right next to it all. That is amazing. And I bet being in New York helps them attract a lot of great technical talent. Though I have to admit, it's pretty unusual that all these companies are here. I mean, New York isn't exactly known as a manufacturing town anymore. You're right. And the fact that the yard is here at all is actually thanks to John Adams, who set aside the land for federal shipyard production back when Brooklyn was all just farmland. And the yard continued to make ships until it was decommissioned in the 1960s, when the city bought the land for industrial use. Today, the city still owns the land, but now Brooklyn is one of the most desirable real estate markets in New York. Okay, so I'm taking you to my favorite place in the yard, which is the roof. That's Johanna Greenbaum, the yard's chief development officer and a former Sidewalk Labs employee. Although publicly owned, the Brooklyn Navy Yard is privately operated and in the midst of a major revitalization. Johanna's job is to redevelop the existing buildings and attract new tenants so the yard can generate the revenue it'll need to grow and develop new buildings in the future. But you've got this amazing view of the New York City skyline. We're literally looking at the Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Williamsburg bridges. We are this closed facility that touches five major Brooklyn neighborhoods, from Dumbo to downtown Brooklyn to Fort Greene, a little bit of Clinton Hill. Many of these neighborhoods were historically black, but over the decades, as land values and rents have increased, their demographics have shifted dramatically. Take Fort Greene, for example. In 2000, that neighborhood was 42% Black, but in 2019, it was only 20%. So providing local residents with access to the yard's jobs, internships, and training opportunities could not only offer pathways to wealth, but also the possibility of staying in their communities. In fact, the yard is actively trying to do just that by forging more connections with its neighbors. So take Nanotronics, for example. They're a next-generation robotics company that I checked out while I was there, which, by the way, Eric, has a very stunning mass timber office. Shout out to episode one, mass timber. Exactly. While I was there, I met Nanotronics chief operating officer, James Williams, and he told me that their partnership with Medgar Evers College, a college of professional studies in a black Brooklyn neighborhood about three miles from the yard, has been critical for their growth. We're able to scale up rather quickly to grow a workforce that is able to work on the most technically exciting uh, and advanced next generation foundational technologies. Uh, So we have grown probably threefold in the last year and a half, and we'll add 80 more people. So if anyone (laughs) has a resume they want to send over, we're more than (laughs) happy to bring you onto our team. And it's not just the companies in the yard that benefit from being in New York. The city benefits too. And that became all too clear when the pandemic hit last year. In March of 2020, we started making these non-invasive ventilators. We realized we're going to have to scale up quick to meet the demand to try and save as many lives as possible. The Navy Yard helped loan us their uh, steam center here in the yard. And we're turning out, you know, uh, 12 to 1,500 of these Uh, medical devices a week that are being sent all over the world and saving as many lives. Johanna told me that Nanotronics wasn't the only company on the yard that sprang into action when COVID struck. We quickly went to companies and said, can you make this? How fast can you make it? Here's another company on the yard who can help you. And people, companies that didn't know each other, went into business with each other and started producing face shields, gowns in like less than a week, which is why I think it's so important to have these types of creative, innovative companies that can actually make things, Um, not just, I mean, computer code is great and software is awesome and offices are important to the ecosystem of New York, but you also need people who are capable of making the thing, especially when supply chain is not what we've all relied on it to be. (laughs) Johanna's point about supply chains is really relevant right now. I mean, the pandemic has really exposed how vulnerable supply chains are. Having manufacturing in cities could not just create jobs, but it could make cities and whole economies more resilient. Right. And think about all of the CO2 emitted as a result of manufacturing things very far away and then shipping them very long distances to get to people. 
if more cities produce needed goods right where people live, that would be a win for sustainability and resiliency. Okay, so we've talked about the benefits of next-gen manufacturing for companies and the benefits for cities, but what's in it for the developers? I mean, as we know from our previous episodes this season, we need real estate developers on board and aligned with communities and cities if urban development is going to become more inclusive and equitable. That's the pivotal question. And for developers in cities like New York, where land values are very, very high, building housing, for example, that's a sure bet. But building a mixed-use development with industrial uses, I mean, that's new. And the economic returns are less of a known quantity. So when I asked Johanna about this question, she explained that the large scale of the Navy Yard and the mix of all the different uses there is what allows them to mitigate the risks. Because the yard doesn't have only industrial buildings, but it has office spaces and commercial spaces. And so it's kind of like the developer's version of a mutual fund diversifying its assets. The more diversified your uses, the more likely you can mitigate financial risk in a downturn. That's really interesting and makes a lot of sense. So if the yard was only one building, or even if it was just kind of blocks of the same type of manufacturing building, the economics might not make as much sense to developers. Right. But actually, Eric, there's another reason why developers might start to be more compelled to introduce industrial uses into their development projects. And what's that? Well, the fact that community members are starting to ask for more industrial job opportunities explicitly. They want neighborhoods where you can walk to your manufacturing job and then walk to your grocery store and pick up your kid from school and then head home. Yeah, just like in those old time cities we mentioned earlier. But where can we find such a neighborhood today? Up north. Put my hat on because it's cold in Boston. I flew up to Boston to check out an interesting new project that I'd read about called Indigo Block and to meet the people responsible for it. Welcome to Indigo Block. I'm Beth O'Donnell. I'm the real estate director at Dorchester Bay Economic Development Corporation. I'm Kimberly Lyle, the director of strategy and development at Dorchester Bay. Dorchester Bay is a mission-driven development company focused on Boston's Dorchester neighborhoods. I live about five minutes up the street. It's a pretty diverse neighborhood, overwhelmingly people of color. We have lots of folks in the community of Cape Verdean origin, Haitian origin, lots of Latinos. Indigo Block is one of Dorchester Bay's most recent projects. It combines affordable rental housing, some homes for affordable ownership, and a state-of-the-art office-slash-industrial facility. Ah, a real live next-gen manufacturing ecosystem. Indeed, Eric. I met Kimberly and Beth outside the industrial facility, where they told me that the idea for Indigo Block started about a decade ago, when the city of Boston acquired the site through foreclosure and started holding community-driven visioning sessions. We are in an area that is surrounded by other neighborhoods that are experiencing a lot of development. And so the effects of gentrification are certainly being felt by folks in this neighborhood. And you wonder who all of the development is for. Um, when you're living in a place where a 10-minute walk away, a one-bedroom apartment, goes for $2,500, you know that's not for you. Mm -hmm. And so you're interested in seeing development that's going to respond to your needs. And it's not just about the housing, it's also about being able to access jobs. But the fact that the community wanted to see a mixed-use development that could provide both housing and jobs, for most developers, that's... Not very straightforward. Many development companies do one or the other, but not both. So when the city put out an RFP to develop the site, Dorchester Bay was the only development company to propose a mixed-use site with housing, commercial, and light industrial. Light industrial, light manufacturing, or potentially food preparation services, all of which could provide opportunities for folks in the neighborhood. And because of it, the community rallied behind them. Part of the reason, you know, the community backed Dorchester Bay and being the developer for this is because our proposal responded to their actual needs. Once they won the RFP, Beth and her team figured out the finances that would make the residential side and the commercial light industrial side viable. They sought out partnerships with Boston Capital Development, Escazu Development, and New Market Community Partners. And then they designed the industrial facility, 
so that it could not only adapt to people's needs over time, but integrate thoughtfully into the neighborhood. I'm ready to take a look if you're ready to show me around. Yeah, it's a pretty cool space. Wonderful. This is our light industrial space, high ceilings. Mm -hmm. There are four loading bays. There is a, a mezzanine, and the idea here is that there might be offices up there oh. and an opportunity to look down onto the production that would space be neat. from the mezzanine. Beth and her team wanted to be thoughtful about mitigating the potential negative aspects of having an industrial facility as your neighbor. Things like big, dangerous trucks, for example. So they intentionally decided to make the building inaccessible to 18-wheelers. Um, the potential for conflict with the abutting residential, and you can see now how close it is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just across the street. Exactly. Yeah. And they tried to design a flexible building that could adapt to a future where economic or jobs needs change. So the spaces are wide open and easily divisible, and the floor is gravel. While we have gravel here as the base, uh, we can be infinitely flexible for our future tenant in terms of where they're going to put their infrastructure, including their plumbing. Because if it were if it were concrete, then you'd have to crack through it every time you wanted to move something around. Correct. Oh, that's pretty neat. At the risk of shouting out a third episode, this space sounds a lot like the flexible ground floor Stoa concept we explored in episode seven. It does. Totally Stoa-like. And not just because of the flexibility of the space either. It's also porous to the ground floor. So those loading dock doors, they open up to the street, and they're right across from the Indigo Block housing complex. Ta-da! <laughs> In fact, the whole site is pretty porous to the neighborhoods around it. The idea was to be an extension of, of the neighborhood, not to be a neighborhood unto ourselves. Mm. So the site is open to the public. The playground is open, and the future ramp to the train are, are all open to the public. And I think you mentioned that it's close to the, the, the T, right? So it does have public transit. The T is right there. <laughs> it is. We also recognize that this area isn't the only area where folks may find employment. And so being able to have access, quick access to downtown, increases access for people in this neighborhood to, to seek out employment elsewhere. To show me just how close everything in the neighborhood really is, Kimberly and Beth walked me just half a block to the new residential building. So we've got everybody from formerly homeless folks all the way up to, you know, families making over $100,000. And the units are interspersed. That's right. There's no poor door situation here. And there's no skimping on, you know, surfaces and finishes based on someone's income, which is really important, right? There's like some houses across the street. It looks like they're also under construction. Are are these part of the project as well? They're meant for first time home buyers. That's pretty remarkable, too, that you were able to incorporate that. That's unusual, right? Well, also in response to community needs. So this is a really good example of how the community recognized that it needed and wanted a couple of different things, and we were able to deliver on on them. Wow. I mean, it sounds like Indigo Block provided everything the neighborhood needed and wanted. It has housing, it has jobs, and it brings a thoughtful mixed-use development with industry into the heart of this community. Yeah, and people are already moving in. Tenants will soon be occupying the industrial facility. Soon the whole neighborhood is going to be buzzing with activity. But I should note that just bringing industrial use into a development project isn't going to automatically equal more jobs for communities of color or other historically excluded groups. Mm, Right. This isn't something that the developer can do alone. Like we saw in Buffalo and in Brooklyn and in Boston, Developers have to work with partners to make sure their projects are directly supporting the communities that need it most, and that those folks are actually receiving the good, fair jobs that companies and projects promise. Yeah, and I think actually what Stephen is doing with the Northland Workforce Training Center and the Redevelopment Corridor is actually a really important precedent in that way. They're intentionally bringing resources and opportunities to the east side of Buffalo. They are forging the connections to companies that can enable east side residents to take advantage of these opportunities. Mm -hmm. And the Indigo Block model is a good blueprint for creating a whole ecosystem of industry co-located with commercial spaces and affordable housing. 
So hopefully in the future, we'll see many more indigo blocks. Developments that bring manufacturing safely back to the urban core in a way that directly benefits communities. Completely. And like Kimberly told me, these are the kinds of developments that will finally provide communities with the opportunities they deserve. So oftentimes when you live in certain neighborhoods, even though you have a point of view about what you need and what you want, other people come in and they give you what they feel like you deserve. And so I guess what I would say to other developers is, even though it may be more challenging, even though it may be outside of your comfort zone, if you are prioritizing a community's needs and desires, then your, your approach needs to be responsive to what they're asking for and not your own limitations. Thank you for listening to City of the Future, a podcast from Sidewalk Labs. Your hosts are Vanessa Quirk and me, Eric Jaffe. Thanks to all the guests who made this episode possible. Stephen Tucker, Johanna Greenbaum, James Williams, Kimberly Lyle, and Beth O'Donnell. And a big thank you to some of the folks who didn't hear in this episode. Claire Weiss, Andrew Whittemore, Tar Forms, Taris Kravchuk, Kingdom Supercultures, Ravi Sheth and Kendall DeBoggy, and Nanotronics, Matthew Putnam. And a big thanks, as always, to Allison Novak, Jesse Shapins, and Crystal Dean of our Sidewalk Urban Development Team. We are produced by Guglielmo Mattioli, our advisor is Benjamin Walker, and our mixer is Andrew Calloway. Story editing was by Rough Cut Collective. Our music is by Adam James Levin Arity of Lost Amsterdam. Our social media and transcripts are by Jamie Lee Hogland. And our art is by the great Tim Cow. We'll see you in the future. Bye. <laughs>